But you can't be a man. Don't even try. Be a woman. Mad Men is a captivating series set in the vibrant world of 1960s advertising, but beneath the surface of glamour and sophistication lies a deeper narrative, a portrayal of women living in a male-dominated world. Well, I was just made director of agency operations. A title, no money, of course. And if they poured champagne, it must have been while I was pushing the mail cart. In this video, I'm analyzing how female characters navigate the fine line between professionalism and femininity through their fashion choices. Rachel Mencken's character is pivotal in establishing the inner world of the Sterling Cooper marketing agency in the show's pilot episode. Introduced as poised and well-educated Jewish heiress and the head of the luxurious department store, Rachel is driven by innovation and growth. She seeks a fresh marketing strategy to elevate her store's presence in the competitive market landscape. Unfortunately, it turns out that Sterling Cooper, like many companies at that time, is a white male-dominated workplace that doesn't let anyone hold the position of authority. In addition, the agency star, Don Draper, sees women primarily as subordinates rather than equals. This mindset becomes evident when Don mistakenly addresses a male co-worker as the client instead of Rachel during the meeting. To top it all off, when Rachel disagrees with Don's proposal, he throws a temper tantrum and says one of the most jarring lines of the show. Don, I'm not gonna let a woman talk to me like this. Rachel's position as an ambitious businesswoman challenges Dawn's expectations, highlighting the disconnect between traditional gender roles and the shifting societal landscape of the early 1960s. As a matter of fact, the social evolution is perfectly illustrated in Rachel's outfit, because in this scene, she wears a Chanel-like two-piece tweed suit. Coco Chanel designed her iconic two-piece suit as a revolutionary departure from the restrictive and impractical women's fashion of of the Belle Epoque period. At that time, women's clothing primarily consisted of corsets, long skirts, and ornate embellishments that hindered movement and reinforced traditional gender roles. Chanel sought to challenge these conventions by creating garments that prioritized comfort, functionality, and freedom of movement without sacrificing elegance. Inspired by menswear and influenced by her own lifestyle as an active and independent woman, she first introduced her tweed suits in the 90s. 1920s. The jacket, characterized by a boxy silhouette and relaxed fit, was a stark departure from the structured and constricting styles of the time. Paired with a matching skirt, the ensemble exuded sophistication and progress. In 1954, Chanel launched an updated suit version in a direct opposition to Christian Dior's ultra-feminine new-look silhouette. It is very telling that in Mad Men, Don's wife Betty almost exclusively wears new look esque dresses in the early seasons. Dior's new look, introduced in 1947, emphasized curves and delicacy and presented an idealized image of womanhood. These designs reinforced the idea of women as delicate and decorative beings whose primary role was to embody beauty and elegance. Betty's character epitomizes this ideal as a suburban housewife and mother, her wardrobe reflects the societal expectations placed upon her. Expectations that Rachel Mencken boldly rejects. And if I weren't a woman, I wouldn't have to choose between putting on an apron and the thrill of making my father's store what I always thought it should be. Thanks to her professionalism and no BS attitude, she gives the Sterling Cooper agency one more chance and, once again, her outfit serves as a visual statement of female empowerment. She enters the room dressed in a vibrant fuchsia two-piece suit and an ultra-glamorous light pink feathered hat, which automatically makes her stand out against the backdrop of dull grey suits. As discussed in my previous videos, Mad Men's costume designer Janie Bryant frequently dressed female characters like Trudy and Betty in colors and prints that made them blend into the background, remain inconspicuous and let their husbands steal the spotlight. Hence, Rachel's bold colored outfit challenges this convention. The sudden burst of vibrant pink 
sets her apart from the crowd, asserting her individuality and position in patriarchal world. Besides, by choosing to wear pink, a color traditionally associated with femininity, she signals her identity as a woman in a male-dominated industry and embraces her femininity on her own terms. It's a perfect outfit to assert her authority over the Sterling Cooper executives who, once again, failed to take her account seriously. Which makes me wonder if you were so focused on my competitors that you failed to visit my store. In contrast to Rachel, Peggy Olsen is a character who struggles with exploring her femininity in a male-dominated workplace. Already from her first day at Sterling Cooper, she's been experiencing objectification. Wouldn't be a sin for us to see your legs. If you pull your waist in a little bit, you might look like a woman. Inappropriate comments and demanding behavior from her colleagues. Why is it that every time a man takes you out to lunch around here, you're... You're the dessert. When she starts to gain weight in season one, her appearance becomes frequently ridiculed by her co-workers. They call a girl like her a lobster. All the meat's in the tail. <laughs> Despite the criticism and scrutiny, Peggy continues to focus on her work and career advancement, demonstrating resilience and determination in the face of adversity. You are hiding a very attractive young girl with too much lunch. But even when she evolves from a naive and inexperienced secretary into a confident and ambitious copywriter, she continues to struggle for respect and recognition in a male-dominated industry. Everybody thinks I slept with you to get the job. They joke about it. Peggy's behavior is often characterized by her determination, intelligence, and assertiveness, qualities typically associated with masculinity in the context of the 1960s. She demonstrates a strong work ethic and isn't afraid to speak her mind or assert herself in professional settings. Am I the only one who can work and drink at the same time? Hence, as the show progresses, her male co-workers see her more and more as one of the guys rather than a woman. This becomes evident in the sixth episode of season two entitled Maiden Form. Paul Kinsey, one of the Sterling Cooper copywriters, pitches a new lingerie campaign based on a very narrow-minded idea that every woman is either a Marilyn Monroe or a Jackie Kennedy. And when Peggy asks her colleagues, which one do you think I am, they giggle and say, <laughs> Later in this episode, Joan advises Peggy You want to be taken seriously? Stop dressing like a little girl. And Dawn tells Betty that the swimsuit she bought at a charity auction makes her look quite desperate. We're talking about a 15 year old lifeguard. We're talking about a bunch of tennis pros, not to mention all those loafing millionaires taking the summer off. You want to be ogled? What's truly intriguing is the contrasting advice given to Betty and Peggy as it reflects the different expectations placed on them. Betty is told to dress more conservatively because, as a married woman, she is expected to be simply beautiful but not desirable. On the other hand, Peggy is encouraged to be more provocative so she can gain acceptance among her colleagues. In both instances, their clothing choices are are shaped by how men perceive them. Nevertheless, Peggy continues to wear clothes to work that make her look professional and appropriate rather than daring. Therefore, she makes quite an impression when she prepares for a date in the season six finale dressed in the shortest mini dress she has ever worn on the show. I'm leaving a little early because I have plans. I hope that's okay. Thanks to this moment, Peggy's colleagues see her in a different light, acknowledging not only her intelligence, but also her femininity and attractiveness. It also highlights the tension between Peggy's professional identity and her gender identity, as she navigates the expectations of being a woman in a male-dominated workplace while striving to be taken seriously for her talents and abilities. Chanel number five? It's all I wear. This line is, of course, a direct reference to Marilyn Monroe's iconic declaration about her exclusive use of Chanel No. 5 in bed. What do you wear to bed? Uh, you wear a pajama top, the bottoms of the pajamas, or the uh, nightgown, or what kind of... So I said, Chanel No. 5, because it's, it's the truth. <laughs>
since its creation in 1921 by Coco Chanel and perfumer Ernst Bohr, Chanel No. 5 has remained a symbol of timeless elegance, femininity, and sensuality. Wearing Chanel No. 5 evokes feelings of intimacy and luxury, enveloping the wearer in a delicate vial of seduction. Thus, it's no surprise that Peggy chose the scent to complement her baby doll dress, a style inspired by nightwear. But this line is also a brilliant throwback to the episode we've just discussed. I think this is when Peggy truly realized she doesn't have to emulate men's actions in order to be successful, but rather carve out her own path and identity. She can navigate the workplace with her unique blend of femininity and strength. I don't know if all women are a Jackie or a Marilyn. Maybe men see them that way. But now I'm curious to know which fashion moment from Mad Men you find the most memorable and why. Sorry that I omitted Joan in this video, a larger analysis of her style is coming very soon. Please subscribe to my channel, leave any video requests and suggestions and I'll see you soon. Bye! She was born in 1898 in a barn. She died on the 37th floor of a skyscraper. She's an astronaut.